Uh, cool. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have Aiden back for his Practical Young series. And today his guest is Muriel McMahon. McMahon. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> so take it away, Aiden. Awesome. All right, welcome to the next episode of Practical Young. Today, our topic will be fairy tales through a Jungian lens, and our guest will be Muriel McMahon. Muriel is a Zurich-trained analyst practicing out of Ontario, and she's a lover of story and specifically uh, fairy tales, which we'll be talking about today. So Muriel, thanks for being with us. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Aidan. And to everyone, welcome. Yeah. Well, let's dive right in. You know, um, you as an analyst and, and as someone who collects and works with fairy tales, you know, that's an interesting intersection that I've noticed in, in the Jungian world. And so I could just sort of ask right off the bat, what's alive for you about fairy tales and, and why fairy tales for you? Well, as, as the introduction, I'm a lover of stories. You know, when mm -hmm. I was a little girl, I I, my favorite dog-eared book, you know, by dog-eared, I mean, it's been read and reread and reread was Grimm's fairy, tale, fairy Tales. So I've always been a lover of stories, whether it was because they were somewhere you could escape to and, you know, magic still lived or whether it because something in the psyche knows that they, it contains the wisdom. So when I went off to train in Zurich, having worked for many years as a, as a literature teacher in an in a inner city high school, to go off and study fairy tales the way a medical student would be studying Grey's Anatomy, it was like pinched me. Is this real? Because it was like here are uh, educated, engaging people, and we'd sit on the rooftop of Bethesda where we uh, kind of had a, a student residence. It was a nurse's residence and we would claim like one floor, 25 students <laughs> studying young. Tell me that wasn't a bit of a trip. And what we would do is we would, um, we would have these uh, little um, uh, index cards with the fairy tales on them and we'd play like flashcards, hold it up and okay, tell, tell me what this tale means. Tell me what it means psychologically. What element of psyche does it convey? So. It's been a trip. I love that. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing experience to have the passion in that in the story and then see where it can be lived out in sort of an academic setting and, and shared with, with deep thinkers. And I'm wondering, that might be a good segue into when we approach fairy tales from that perspective. I've heard Von Franz talk about reading fairy tales scientifically. Um, how is that different, right? How is reading a fairy tale scientifically or psychologically different than reading it for entertainment? Well, I think, um, I think what really makes entertainment is when it touches something deep in us. And so even when we go to the tales because we're entertained by them, the reason we're entertained is because they speak something of the soul. And so um, Von Franz, when you listen to her um, or read the transcripts of her lectures, she's very engaging. But she also, in some of her published work, seems to come across as pretty didactic, almost formulaic. But I don't think that's the case. I think she's earned the authority that comes from having interpreted you know, thousands and I think someone said 60,000 tales. And that in, in doing it with a certain degree of discipline, then I think what it does is it separates out the subjective from the objective truth. So the subjective truth is, and we find this in Jungian psychology all the time, you know, a, a dream is what I think it means, what I feel it means. And what we uh, practice uh, in classical Jungian psychology, and it's reinforced in my work with the Assisi Institute, that we say there is an objective truth to the psyche. So you have to keep coming back to the image. So when we say we scientifically study the fairy tale, what we're saying is we're exploring the objective truth of the image. Because if we have the objective truth, what our subjective um, feelings and thoughts will tell us how aligned we are. 
But if we take a tale or we take a dream and we try to make it fit whatever is our feeling or our thoughts, we're gonna do damage to the tale. And so the scientific approach is to see this as the anatomy of the psyche. It's not about a individual psyche and then to have that discipline to unpack it, you know, unpack it in terms of what is the opening? Like what, what is the field? What is the stage that this tale is set upon? Who are the characters that are gonna carry the energy of this story? What are the enduring and internal um, archetypal motifs? What are the twists and the turns? And what is the conclusion of the tale? So that's the discipline. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that distinction between the objective perspective of the image being sort of the scientific one versus the subjective interpretation. I'm wondering for our listeners that um, have less experience perhaps with Jungian thought or, or um, this differentiation between subjective and objective ways of looking at an image, for example. Can you think of an example? It could be a dream example or a fairy tale example how someone might look at some of the material through an objective lens versus how they might look at it through a, a subjective lens. Yeah, and I think that this is key and I think this is really important because the subjective lens will also often show us the complex. It will often show us what occludes our ability to see objective truth. And the objective truth is the thing that is eternal, the thing that, that um, relates to the archetypal. So I'm sitting in uh, Northern Ontario, Canada, and there's a beautiful uh, forest outside my window. And so, and, and I just saw a squirrel, you know, so let's take the squirrel. I could ask 10 different people about squirrel. And if someone hates the little critters because they eat all the bird feed and like my husband creates these elaborate contraptions to slow down the squirrels eating the bird seed. Someone else could say, oh my God, that's my dotum. That's my, that's my spirit animal. I love squirrels. I have, I have them embroidered on my favorite sweater. You know, that's all subjective because how you feel about squirrel is subjective. Whether or not you feel good, bad, or indifferent, the squirrel is squirrel. So then the objective truth of the squirrel is what is a squirrel? What does it do? What are its behaviors? What are its proclivities? And then you compare the two because if what you say a squirrel is that um, whenever I see squirrel in a dream or a fairy tale, I'm going to think of all the work that's involved in trying to limit its voraciousness. That's gonna be very different than if I see it as an objective reality that it is preparing to be in the forest in the winter time. Therefore, it's putting down its um, its supplies. Does, mm. does that help? Yeah, it sounds to me like when we're looking at an image through this sort of um, Jungian lens, it's like being able to let go of of or not necessarily permanently let go, but temporarily let go of our own subjective thoughts about it, associations, things, strong reactions of like, dislike. Um, experiences so we can look at the fact of what's in front of us and um, get a little scientific about what for example a squirrel is in, in your in your example yeah because and, in your likes or your dislikes are important and I never dismiss or underestimate that when I when someone brings me a dream image or we're looking at a fairy tale together what they feel and what they think is important because it's going to tell me something about the complex and if we have the objective reality, the objective truth of the image, then we're going to be able to see whether or not the ego is aligned or misaligned to the objective truth. So we're constantly looking at those two things to try to bring them more into balance. Because what's that wonderful line? We can never solve the problem with the mind that created it. Mm. So the dream or the fairy tale is going to show us fairy tales will constellate our complexes. They will trigger us. And if you have that discipline to look at them objectively, to try to see what is universal in this tale, then you can say, oh, and this is why, this is why I'm reacting so strongly because it's, it's tripped one of my complexes. 
in Zurich, when I, I, I don't know if you know this, but when you're training to be a Jungian analyst, you take a six hour fairy tale exam. That's how seriously they take it, six hours. They, they uh, you show up at the exam and they give you the fairy tale like 15 minutes before, almost like ceremonially, you know, in a sealed envelope, you open it up and you say, oh, please, God, let this be a tale I studied on the rooftop of Bethesda with my friends. And let's hope I didn't have too much wine and I remember what it meant. So you open it up and you read it. So I open up my fairy tale and I've never seen this one before. Darn. Okay, so I'm going to really have to practice. So they take you into this little room. And you've got three examiners. You've got a chief examiner and then two observers. So what you do is for six hours, you write a paper on a translation of this tale. They've got a few uh, etymology dictionaries and a few symbol books. And you work this tale and you write a professional paper at the end of six hours. Well, my tale was Grimm's number 67, uh, The Twelve Huntsmen. And I thought I had it. I, I was so convinced this was a tale because the 12 huntsmen, if you, if you read the story, are actually women disguised as huntsmen. So I thought, well, clearly this is about the emergence of feminine authority out from the persona of the patriarchy. And on I went and I proved it and I proved it. And I almost failed because I was triggered by the, um, the fairy tale. And I tried to work the fairy tale into my complex rather than recognize, okay, here's the subject. Some of the things I said were true, were true to the tale, but I think the way I was saying it, and the reason that they crush the peas is because they're learning to walk like men. And the reason they don't notice the spinning wheels is because the patriarchy thinks women are only good in household tasks. And so, and on and on I went. So I learned and, and uh, an analyst said to me, be very mindful of what you almost fail in your exams when you're studying to be an analyst because therein likely lies your destiny because you're gonna keep working it, you're gonna keep working it. And that's probably why I came to fairy tales and why I'm so passionate about them. I wanted to understand that young woman who got triggered into a complex and almost blew the whole exam because of that. And then I wanted to be sure that I didn't do it again. And that I also taught people how to hold the complex and see the objective truth. Mm. Maybe that's a little too much self-disclosure, but there you go. <laughs> no, I'm so glad you shared that I was going to ask if you were able to share what your fairy tale was or, or how the exam went for you. So you, you launched right into it. Yeah. And, um, well, the way it turned out is that the chief examiner failed me and the other two loved my interpretation. So they fought amongst themselves for about four days and I kept waiting to get the results. And then the chief examiner contacted me and said, well, we have decided we will pass you, <laughs> which meant... <laughs> I squeaked by. <laughs> and look, I mean, and I love that that turned into a passion, you know, for understanding that that uh, that moment. Something you said really jumped out at me about when you looked at that fairy tale in your exam, that it triggered something, what you're calling a complex, and that yeah. led you to take the material into that perspective. Like it's material from bringing into what's being brought up inside of you, this particular lens of patriarchy and femininity and how that sort of translates. So I wonder if a way of describing the scientific approach to fairy tales is, well, perhaps I'll start with the unscientific one. The unscientific one would be whatever a fairy tale provokes to take the, the material of the fairy tale out of the fairy tale and into your world versus a scientific approach might be acknowledging what happens in your world. Like you said, the likes and the dislikes and you know what's happening. But being able to take all of that into the world of the fairy tale and kind of say, but what's really going on over there? Yeah. You know what I like to teach my students is that, you know, we can look at um, contemporary issues and we should be looking at contemporary issues and we should be using the wisdom of the tale to guide us into the things that we're struggling with collectively. But to stand in the collective issue or the contemporary issue and to look at the fairy tale is to miss it. 
it's better to stand in the fairy tale and look at contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a lovely presentation recently by Jennifer Selig on um, the results of the American election through the point of view of Martin Luther King Jr. and then Obama, Trump, and Biden. And so she was explaining that whole idea of the dream of America and where are we now? And at the end of the call, I was put on the spot and I was, someone asked, so if this were a fairy tale, what is, what kind of a fairy tale is it? And I thought, oh, that's pretty charged. I'm a Canadian. I'm gonna make a comment on um, American politics. And am I gonna just get myself into trouble because we all have so many complexes around these things. But it came to me because of her presentation. Once upon a time in the land of the free and the home of the brave, there was a king and the king had a dream and the king had three sons. The firstborn was very much like the king. The second born, nothing like the king. And the third was a bit of a dumbling. He had a stutter. And would he bring back to the kingdom what was needed to fulfill the dream? And so that's standing in the fairy tale and looking at contemporary issues rather than standing in contemporary issues and trying to say, well, this, this is what it means. Do you understand? Yeah, I, I love that. It's making me very curious to spend more time looking at fairy tales that way. Um, in fact, maybe we can jump into the Frog King if, if this segue works um, for you. I'm going to put a link to the Frog King for the listeners on the podcast um, in the podcast episode, and those here in the meetup group will have the link too in the um, in the event. Is there a way to do that? And in terms of looking at the Frog King, if we stand inside of that fairy tale and look at our contemporary lives, whether as individuals or collectively, um, does that pattern or can that pattern apply to, the, to this fairy tale? Yeah, I mean, if you're by the very title itself, and that's one of the things that I teach in my fairy tale course is that we have to slow it down at the beginning, because at the beginning, we have to avoid what's called conjecture, because conjecture is where we just take a little bit of information and we run with it to support our conclusion, like I did with the 12 Huntsmen. But if we, if we are forming on a hypothesis, we're using the same evidence, but we're holding it with a light touch. So Frog King or Iron Henry, that's the name of this fairy tale. So the fact that we have Frog King right there in the frog and in the king, we have the juxtaposition. You know, mm -hmm. so if you slow it down and you say, so what does it mean? How, how is a frog like a king and how is a king like a frog? And how are they different? Are they shadow to one another? What, what is the objective reality of a frog? The, rejective, the objective reality of a frog is that they are masters of adaptation and survival. In fact, they were around uh, with the dinosaurs, yet they survived. So there's something in the frog that is gonna tell us in the very title, this is gonna be something about transformation and metamorphosis. So knowing that, if you then say, well, let's look at contemporary issues. And are we in a period of transition? Are we in a metamorphosis? Are we into transformation? Or are we going to hold an iron fist on these times like a king and say, this is tradition, we will keep it this way, it will never change. So if you even take that title and you say through that lens, if I stand in, there is something about frog that needs to be bridged to king then already I'm opening myself to the field, which then maybe will give me some wisdom to speak to contemporary times, as opposed to standing in contemporary times and say, you know, tell me what it means. So in this fairy tale, I think it opens with, um, you know, in olden times, in olden times when wishing still mattered or wishing still worked. Whoa, what an opening. And that's the thing about fairy tales as well. They're always an invocation. They're an invocation to come into this field, step out of your ordinary reality, open up to the treasures of the imagination and the eternal 
in olden times where wishing still matter. By its very nature, it's saying, so why don't you wish anymore? Why don't you dream anymore? Why is there no magic in your world? And so this tale is inviting you into a time when people still lived very close. We would call it scientifically to like synchronicities, but in olden times where wishing still mattered, there was a king and he had three beautiful daughters, but even here we have a king and his daughters. So again, that's going to tell you something about this tale is going to be exploring something of the highest order of the masculine and the emergent feminine, his daughters. This is the future and they are beautiful. You know, so, so we're not even into the first sentence yet, but we can already beginning to say, oh, so what am I going to learn about that if I stay in the tale? If I jump into, well, it's about, you know, uh, the, the hierarchy of power being usurped by the emergent feminine, then I may be right. But if I use everything in the tale to try to prove that conclusion, I'm probably going to just learn what I already know, as opposed to step in the beauty of step into the beauty of the tale and see what I can discover. Wow. Yeah, I love how much time you spent on just the first sentence there in terms of getting the context. It's when I read it, it's so easy to just it's almost like pass through it without catching all of that. You know, you just read the sentence and move on. There was an analyst from Japan. I wish I could remember his name, but I saw him in a presentation in Montreal and he was, he was chiding we Westerners, we North Americans. He was saying, you know, you're, and he was using the, the image of the archer. And he's saying, and you North Americans are all about the target, all about the target. You wanna hit the target. You want the arrow, you wanna hit the target. Hold the tension and hit the target. And he said, in Japan, it's the pose of the archer, that the archer has to capture that full sense of beauty. And if he does make this, um, this beautiful expression with his body, it will hit the target because it is through that attention to inhabiting the field of the beauty of the archer that he will hit the target as opposed to what he was saying, we North Americans just want to get there. So, you know, to, in, to your humility to say, well, yeah, I just, I gloss over that. I want to get to know the king. I want to see the action. I want to know where this story is going. So if you slow it down at the beginning, you're beginning to pick up those, those jewels that you're like, just like in a fairy tale, you're going to need for when it gets, when the going gets rough. The worst part of the fairy tale or that the worst part, um, the, the, the middle of the tale. When you're in the middle of the tale, you rarely know where it's going to go. You know, is that animal a helper or is it going to devour you? You know, like what, what is happening in the middle of a tale? Someone said, and that's where we are right now globally. We're in the middle of a fairy tale that's being written. And that's the most precarious time. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like you can't, see it when you're in the middle of it perhaps it's easier in hindsight or when you have the full tale because you can explore the full tale yeah. yeah yeah so this is a wonderful tale to start your study with if you haven't um looked at fairy tales in a in a, a scientific way and to really slow it down because it's accessible and you've got the incredible comparison oh did it freeze okay sorry i thought we froze you've got the incredible comparison of um the disney version now if you've read this tale and if you haven't spoiler alert but what happens in this tale you know she loses her ball into the well and the frog rescues it and gets her to promise to be his companion and sit at her table and uh, come to her room and sleep in her bed. And she just doesn't want any part of it. She's got her golden ball back and she's just going to, uh, she's going to blow him off. And he comes knocking at the door. And then her father, the king, and it says something about the kingdom. The father says, you made a promise and you must hold to your promise. 
and she tries the tears and she tries any of the ploys of a father's daughter, but it's not going to work because he's saying what is most honorable is the promise. And so she has to have him sit at her table and eat from her plate and even take him up to her bedroom. And, and he's the frog croaks all the time his demands. This is what I want. This is what I want. You will do this. You will do this. And she's just, she's just, you can see the tension building. She's getting to like her last nerve, the last straw. Now in the Disney tale, and this is what's so sad in the Disney tale, she kisses the frog and he transforms. But in the original tales, cross-culturally, she doesn't kiss the frog. When he finally says, now, take me into your bed, that level of intimacy with this vile creature, at that point, she picks him up and flings him against the wall. Now, is this tale advocating violence? I don't think so. I think this tale is saying in the human psyche, there comes a point where the feminine has to find her healthy aggression in order to partner with the masculine. Otherwise, this is gonna be a union where he's making all kinds of demands to her all the time and she's adapting, adapting, adapting. When a man comes into a confrontation with his anima, and by that I mean the contrasexual other, he has to be willing to come into an encounter with her. He can't just do her bidding or can he expect she will do his bidding? It, it has to come into that place of encounter. If you haven't read, um, it, it was just released, Jung's Black Books. And the Black Books are the source for the Red Books, which are the source for the collected works. So most of us encountered Jung backward. We had the collected works, and then we got the Red Book, and now we have the Black Books. So it's really exciting to get to that source material. And those Black Books are like fairy tale. I mean, he is encountering these, these images deep in his own psyche. And, you know, his anima is saying, you are an artist, you are an artist. And he's saying, no, I am a scientist. You know, and so there's this, and he, Jung says, had he given in to what the anima promised, he would have lost his mind because he needed the rigor of science to go into these depths. So this fairy tale, the Frog King Iron Henrik talks about the transformation of the masculine and the feminine. So in a masculine psyche, his encounter with the anima and in a feminine psyche, her willingness to find her own healthy aggression. So to find her own animus and not just be a father's daughter. Hmm. Yeah, that is, everything you say is exciting me and making me want to explore these fairy tales more. I mean, one thing I do want to catch for our listeners is that when you talk about the anima and the animus, the contrasexual, you know, we tend, I think, culturally to think of relationships as really being with another person. So, you know, my relationships with my girlfriend, for example, really are coming from just me relating to just her. But sort of the Jungian thing is to say, well, I have a feminine dimension inside of myself. I think colloquially we talk about, you know, the feminine side of a, of a man or the masculine side of a woman. But the idea is I have a relationship to the feminine inside of myself and, and that relationship inside of myself to the feminine very much colors my relationships to, to women in, in the real world, for example. So it's worth catching that because then I think what you're saying in reading The Frog King in terms of the feminine um, forming a relationship with the healthy aggression, that's an internal, I guess that's what I want to say is that's an internal experience, yeah. right? That may play out also in terms of how they relate, uh, how a woman might relate to, to a man, but that really, um, or I should ask, is it true when we look at it this way in the fairy tale, that it's ultimately sort of an inner experience. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because Marie-Louise von Franz um, stresses that in almost every, every one of her books 
in the fact that it's not about an individual psyche, it's about the collective psyche. So the, this is the anatomy of psyche itself. So to say this is about a man and a woman is probably to do damage to the man and the woman as well as to do damage to the wisdom in the tale. So it is, you know, so when you say that, like there's um, what's called projection, is that there is something hidden in you and that's what attracts you to the contrasexual out there. And so if it's a good match, they will hold it for you and that will keep it close to you. And then you will begin to relate it and, and see, oh, they are so much more than what I asked them to hold of me. And then what you do is you recollect that part, that's you. So in every relationship, there's at least four because there's conscious you, unconscious you, conscious other, unconscious other. And so sometimes the relationship is going unconscious to conscious, you know, when you're in a mood, sometimes it's going conscious to conscious, sometimes going conscious to unconscious. So fairy tales will give you a map how to navigate that because when you're in the turmoil of a relationship, it's really hard to navigate it. So fairy tales do give you the map. They give you the pattern. They give you a story about what could happen and all fairy tales don't end well. All fairy tales can sometimes say, and if that is the pattern that's unfolding, it could go to hell in a handbasket. So. Mm. Now, yes, and I do know, as, and I'll just throw this out there, that there is in um, contemporary Jungian um, uh, research, there's looking at the whole idea of classical Jungian theory of the contrasexual masculine and feminine in terms of gender fluidity and trans studies. So there, that is being explored, but the fairy tales even have some of those stories that, where you can get a sense where it's not so clearly defined. And so what is that saying? And how can we find some wisdom to guide us? How can we find a map during these turbulent times where it becomes so easily politicized? So. Mm. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that up um, in terms of this contrasexual idea and how that has become more fluid in, in recent times, um, which perhaps was not the case when Jung was writing or when von Franz was writing some of this material. And I heard you say that a fairy tale can give you a little bit of a pattern, like to give you a sense of what pattern is unfolding and if it's heading towards a good end or if it's heading towards a, a sort of a tragic end. Um, is that to say that we can use fairy tales to sort of almost um, give us a, a compass or maybe um, a context for what's happening in our actual lives? Yeah, I would think that, um, you know, Irving Laszlo said field precedes form. And so the field is that energetic, we could say in terms of fairy tale as the archetype itself. That's the archetypal field that this, that's the stage on which this pattern is going to unfold. So that's why I teach people to really slow down at the beginning of the tale, because if you have missed what field you're in, then you're probably going to get lost in the, in the weeds, in the reeds that if you can first find the field and then say, and what forms are enacting this pattern? And then you get a sense of whether the pattern is generative or whether the pattern is non-generative, what's getting in the way, you know? And, and so fairy tales can give you that compass that says, oh, okay, this seems familiar. It's amazing to me. And maybe it's just because I love stories, but it comes across the room as well. It's amazing to me sometimes when someone's describing their, this life event, they will reference a fairy tale. You know, that's, they, they will remember something from their, from their childhood and say, oh God, this is just like, you know, and then, okay, well, let's look at that. Maybe, maybe, maybe the wisdom that we're looking for is in that fairy tale. And dreams, dreams themselves sometimes play out as a fairy tale. But just as with a fairy tale, you have to separate out what gets triggered of the complex to be able to see the archetype in the dream because the dream will have the archetype and the complex. Both voices are speaking, the same is true in fairy tales. Mm. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good map if you can read it. <laughs> if you can't, you know, at the beginning of um, The Hobbit, 
you know, where, where J.R.R. Tolkien gives us that lovely map. So we kind of know what the territory looks like. Well, a fairy tale will give you that too, if you take the time. In fact, I've encouraged my students to do that sometimes. Give me a map for this tale. In, in the Frog Prince or in the Frog King, we have the kingdom where there's the king and his three daughters. We don't hear anything about a queen. So as soon as you hear that, you've got to say, where's the queen? You know, and so where's the feminine? Where's the higher order of the feminine? Hopefully, this tale is going to take us through something to get a glimpse of that. Or maybe the tale is going to show us why we don't have it. So when the youngest daughter leaves the palace and goes out into the forest, we know she is leaving the center of consciousness and going into the unconscious. She's going into the forest. And there in the forest, there's an old linden tree. There's the mother, the old linden tree. And there's a well. There's the, we could say the womb. There's where the waters of the unconscious can be, can be reached. If this, were, um, if this were an analysis and someone told me that they went like same story, and they went out and they were in a swamp, it would be very different than they were next to a well, because the well tells me there's some containment. The swamp tells me that perhaps the ego structure needs some work. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And you said something there I want to draw out as well about looking at the beginning of the story where we slowed down in this in this reading and looking at not just what's presented not not just what's there but what's missing as a piece of what the story is about yeah, yeah. it's always a good practice which is part of the science a good practice is to say so what's missing you know because that'll tell you something if you've got a stepmother in a fairy tale then what's missing is the mother like where is the mother is she dead and if she's dead then the stepmother is the shadow of that missing mother. And if she's idealized, she becomes the fairy godmother versus the wicked stepmother. Often in fairy tales, that's like a, a trope in fairy tales that the stepmother will tell us something about the mother that we couldn't look at unless it were a stepmother, unless it's somewhat removed. And so that becomes valuable as well. But that becomes, so to look at what's missing, will tell you something about the field that you're in. And to also look at things like exaggerations. In this fairy tale, the youngest daughter was so beautiful, so incredibly beautiful that the sun itself was amazed at her beauty. Like, well, over the top, you know? When it's over the top like that, you gotta think projection, your honor. Like we better, we better look at this carefully, you know? So it's like, it's like, so what is, it, it's almost like it's an archetypal possession that the whole of consciousness is possessed by the beauty of this young feminine. And so is it going to be able to see clearly? Is it going to be able to discern or is it going to be cursed? So when you've got that exaggeration, you got to look to the opposite. Ta da who cursed, who cursed the, um, the king's son? It was a witch. So there we have the opposite. We have the feminine that is destructive, that is cursed. And von Franz said, um, redemption in a fairy tale is the breaking of a spell, the breaking of a possession. And if you've ever been under the throes of an archetypal possession of any kind, you know that when it breaks, it feels like it feels you can almost hear the Alleluia chorus. I mean, it, it really does feel like something divine has happened. Wow. I, I wish we had time to just go through this whole tale at this pace, because I'm getting so much out of just hearing your perspective. Um, but I know we're coming to a close. And for those uh, listening in to our conversation today, what are some resources you might recommend just to to continue this this exploration of how to look at fairy tales? Yeah, I would say that your your go to place, or at least my go to place is anything Marie Louise von Franz has written particularly on fairy tales. And if what you do, the, here, here's what is just gold, go to the indexes. 
In fact, the indexes of Marie-Louise von Franz fairy tale translations are the best amplifications you can use for your own dreams. So if you, you know, you look at the index of the tale and it says golden ball, and then it'll give you like 12 explanations of what she says the golden ball is. And then what that's doing is it's amplifying it with that archetypal material and it's making it so rich. So I would say that that's a starting point for sure. That's the more great. you immerse yourself in the tales, the more that you will learn about it. Did you know the story about Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim? He wrote the, uh, the Uses of Enchantment and it became a go-to book on the imagination and the use of fairy tales. Well, the truth is he took one, one course in psychology. This has been proven. So where did he get so, so smart? Like, where did he get those ideas? Because he read the fairy tales. And so he let the fairy tales be his, his I guess, his PhD. So I'm not suggesting you do that and you pass yourself off as a PhD, but it does, it does tell us that there is wisdom in the tale that you will take in almost like through osmosis. So read them every night. Go to bed with yeah. fairy tale. I love that. It brings to my mind a quote that's, a, I don't know the quote, and I know that it's attributed to Einstein about if you want your children to be smart, have them read fairy tales. Do you know this quote? Yes, it was uh, a mother came to Einstein and said she wanted her son to become a great scientist. Immediately tells you that that kid's going to have a problem <laughs> because she's going to the best scientist in the world with an agenda for her son. But anyway, said, I want him to be intelligent. So how can I train him? He says, have him read fairy tales. And she went, okay, yeah, fine and good. But, but then what? Have him read more fairy tales. I love it. I, that's the perfect... Uh... Uh, ending note, I think, um, and I'm certainly going to read some more fairy tales after our conversation. One last thing I'd like to say is that um, uh, Marian, Muriel McMahon um, also teaches classes at the Assisi Institute regularly, um, which is in Mystic, Connecticut. So you can look up that website, see what classes are going on. And uh, Muriel, thank you so much for being with us. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Wonderful folks. So now is the time for Q and A. Uh, we have four rules as usual. Number one, type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom to ask questions. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. Number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anything anybody says and do so courteously. All right, uh, so um, it's going to be Giampiero first followed by Leslie. Give me just a second. Let me go ahead and enable. Yes, uh, Jepiero, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I hope I'm not reading too much into the story, but this is what I got out uh, at the beginning. So the frog is old. She even asked, is it you, the old frog? And she's the youngest daughter. So they're both also in the dark forest, which, which is like, they're there to learn something about themselves. Uh, Japiero, please keep your question brief. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. My, my question is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> my train of thought disappeared. I'll come back. Come back. Uh, once, once you get it, just go ahead and type an exclamation mark again. I'll come back to you. Okay, sir? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be Leslie followed by George. Leslie. Thanks. Um, I, my, my reaction to uh, when the, the speaker said that... Um, that she, that she almost failed her exam because she was, and I, I said the complex, she, she, she immersed herself too much in her own complex. I, I just, I embrace the idea to a significant extent that there's no wrong way to interpret art. Like who's, like, do we know what the author's intention was in writing that fairy tale? Um, all these, all these scholars are declaring what the correct interpretation is, but what interpretation did the writer intend? And does it even matter if we have a different interpretation? I, I, is, there, is there really a wrong way to interpret something? Okay, that's an excellent question. And it's a question that we debate in the Jungian circles all the time. You know, is there objective truth? And I believe that there is. And I believe that Jung believed that there was. There was archetype of truth. And so to, um, you know, to say anything goes or 
you know, your interpretation is correct is, I, I, th I think is to be led down a path into your, into a kind of your bark. This is what I already know. And it doesn't open you up to the opportunity to explore something new. If I go to a surgeon, I want, I want somebody who knows more than me. So if I go to, um, you know, the art of fairy tale analysis, I want someone to know more about it than I do. Like, by all means, if you're not, if it's not your bread and butter, if you're not using it as a map into resolving something in, in your psyche, then yeah, read it for entertainment and what you like about it, you like about it. But if you really want to see it as holding the anatomy of the psyche, then I think you have to watch that you don't get hoodwinked by your own complexes, as I did. Thank, thank you, Muriel. Next up is George, Laura, Zach, Gia Piero, and Robert. Josh, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you, Muriel, Aiden. What a delicious, delicious dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, my question is, I believe I printed it in the chat. Um, where is it? Um, okay, I wrote it down anyway. Does grief, does grief have a place in this fairy tale? If yes, would you speak, uh, would you speak to that, please? No, oh, what a wonderful question. Well, if we practice the discipline and we slow it down in the beginning, we say, is this a motherless daughter? So if it's a motherless daughter, where's the mother? So is her, is her being a father's daughter, is her allegiance to her father, is his kind of demanding way such that there is no meeting in, mediating influence of the feminine and perhaps that is to be grieved. And so then what gets projected onto the frog is all that is, all that is uh, disavowed, all that has been rejected, all that's gone into the unconscious. So it's an excellent question. You know, so to be able to take a question like that and see if it's in the fairy tale or stand in the fairy tale and say, what does this tell me about grief? I think would be an incredible practice. Yeah. Okay. Can I further that? Because I'm enjoying this question and, and, and your response. Um, it, what comes up for me is is what you just said, Muriel, about like the grief of the missing father, how that plays out. The line that probably stood out to me the most in the fairy tale was when the when the frog comes and visits and is outside the door, and um, uh, she goes to she goes to see who's outside. Opens the door. There's the frog. Slams the door great haste sat down to dinner and was quite frightened and the king saw plainly that her heart was beating violently so we kind of see here's the image of a frog it's a, it must have been a very small entity sitting on the front porch and her reaction is this massive her heart's beating she's frightened so and doesn't there, the father say at that point is there a giant out there yeah you know, like what has been so rejected so yeah. cast out of the kingdom and often our misavowed, our, our disavowed emotions are. And when they come knocking again, when they first present themselves, you know, to that young feminine, that that frog did appear to be a monster to the old king. He saw it, it must be a giant that has you so feared. Hmm. Wonderful. Our next question is from Laura. Laura, what's your question? Not so much a question. I never liked fairy tales and didn't introduce them to my daughter either. So I'm a fairy tale novice. Um, <laughs> is there anything for fairy tales <laughs> um, like, you know, novice? Because I think I'm really interested now. Okay, well, then, then maybe we've got a convert. I'm pleased to hear. No, let me say this. I was in a women, I've, I'm in a reading group and I've been with the same women for 25 years. And so when I was going off to train in Zurich all those years ago, they said, okay, Miro, give us something that helps us understand what the heck you're going off to do. And so I, I uh, chose the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves, because it has the fairy tales and it has exquisite commentary. Now, what happened in the group is half the women were only interested in the commentary. They didn't want to read the stupid tales. And the other half of the women loved the tales, but didn't give a rat's ass about the commentary. So I would say, find yourself somewhere in between that. But I think it is a nice in. It's it because it circumambulates the wild woman archetype. And I think she does a beautiful job, job because she also has a deep connection to the indigenous. 
And so it, it really kind of takes us back to those um, places where we sat on the dirt floor together in front of the fire and told stories. So I would suggest that's, that's a way in. And just, um, I don't know, read the tales. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Zach, Giappiaro, Robert, and Madeline. Uh, Zach, go ahead. Yeah, I had a, a question about um, kind of fairy tales generally. I'm, I'm wondering, I, I'm assuming most of these are were written um, unconsciously in, this, in the sense the, the authors or authors, if these were kind of passed down through an oral tradition, weren't kind of consciously thinking about all of this symbolism. Um, and my question is, well, first of all, if that's correct, and, and then second of all, now that we are kind of becoming conscious of all these symbolisms, what does that do to our ability to um, to write fiction and, and fairy tales or, or fantasy generally? Like, does does kind of knowing about all of these symbols does that help us um, create uh, stories and fairy tales, or does that kind of um, can we kind of get in our own way? Excellent question. I mean. The, you know, the soul speaks in images, the soul, the soul speaks in metaphor, we know that from our dreams, and we know that from good art. And so these fairy tales have has that in it. Um, the origins of fairy tales, how they came to be that's hotly contested. And, you know, some would say that they are um, myths and literature that degenerate and they, it loses the clothing of the time and then becomes more just the anatomy of psyche itself. That tends to be where I would go. Um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien does a beautiful analysis of the fairy realm. And then he also then segues that into then how to write, how to write in that way where you are informed by it. But let me tell you a little story about um, the, the biggest bomb for Disney was Hercules. And why? It's an incredible myth. Why when they had all this merchandise of stuffies and bed clothes, kids didn't want it. Kids didn't want to see the movie again. And it's because there's one point in the movie where it deviates from the archetypal pattern. That little Hercules hears the cry of a damsel in distress and he jumps up and it's great animation, but he jumps up and says, and I will save her and I will be forever known as a hero. It's like, no, you don't get what a hero is. A hero is unselfish service and courage. It's not becoming famous. And so it's like, they, think of all the money they invested in that movie. And it was a flop. Apparently it was their biggest flop because it didn't appreciate and stay loyal to the archetypal pattern. It didn't know what hero means, what hero means in the human psyche. So I think if you try and write like a fairy tale, you're probably going to fail it would be better that you somehow learn as much as you can about whatever symbols or images are calling you and you wanna write about, and then you, you check it out against the archetypal truth, the archetypal pattern to see whether it's coherent. coherent. Coherence and sequencing is really important in our study of fairy tales because if it's, if it's incoherent, if it's not following the path, then the fairy tale is probably saying, and this is what happens again and again and again, that the pattern doesn't unfold according to nature because something gets in the way. Thank you, Mariel. Uh, next up is Jampiero, Robert, Madeline, Shrikan, David, and Chori. Jampiero, go ahead. Okay. Is it because of her youth that the youngest daughter fails to see the difference between her ideal plaything and the possibility for relationship and intimacy? Yeah, great question. I mean, the way that I would read that is that because she is the youngest, you know, she's she's got sisters and she's got the kingdom and she's probably, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like my brother is the golden boy because he was born last. And so my parents learned a thing or two about child rearing. So I think the youngest often is the one that's going to carry the story. You'll see that in fairy tales over and over again. But I think what it is, is she, she doesn't appreciate 
the gift of privilege. You know that wonderful line to whom much has given, been given, much is expected. And to her, it's a plaything. She plays with it. And she doesn't recognize perhaps the sacrifices that have allowed her to hold that. That's, that's the self. That's the, that's the symbol of wholeness made of gold. And she has to lose it so she can find it again. She can find it in a new way. It's like, it's like the story of Psyche and Eros, you know, that, that first union, she can only see him under the cloak of darkness. And then she loses him. And because she loses him, she matures through her labors. And I think it's, that's the archetypal story. So great question. Thank you. Uh, Robert requests me to read out his question. Uh, he asks, how would a Jungian approach um, interpret uh, this biblical line from Deuteronomy. Um, whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do because you made your vow freely to the Lord, your God, with your own mouth. Well, that's in the tale, isn't it? You know, she makes the promise. But if you recall in the fairy tale, even while she makes the promise, she has no intention of honoring it. So again, not only does, does she not appreciate the gift of her privilege, she has a lot, a lot of growing up to do to come in alignment with that biblical truth. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is Madeline. Madeline, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to go next. Yesterday we had a meetup on art and somebody asks, you know, somebody who had children ask, at what point can you expose children to art? Is it like 10, 11? I am really blown away by the fact of the deep meaning that is carried in these fairy tales and the fact that two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds actually get it. So what does it say about the power of fairy tales, power of education, power of learning for, for children um, based on yeah. this depth, depth of these fairy tales? When you look at the, um, um, the Disney-fied fairy tales, you know, that have been cleaned up, versus the raw truth, particularly some of the Russian tales. Oh, Maron, like the, they're layered and they're just so, you know, people do get torn to pieces and get eaten, you know? So when you look at these tales, you're saying like, am I going to damage my child by introducing them too young? Like how old should they be? And I say, they, the, the truth is kids, have monsters that live under the beds and in the closets. They have these fears that erupt in their psyche. The fairy tales give them a story to hold it. You know, it becomes the frame. So it's like um, Melanie Klein, you know, that when she was working with a child who had high anxiety and she was able to make a translation or interpretation that says, this is what I think you're doing. You want you know, you want to climb back inside of my womb and bomb me from the inside out. And you're thinking, what? Where did she get that? But it then became a story for the child's anxiety and they weren't so riddled by it. So I think that, you know, the, the kind of, what do we call that, the helicopter parents who want to make sure that the children are never challenged. You know, as Jonathan Hyatt says, we raise a whole generation of children doomed to fail. We have to give them the tools in order to confront adversity and the fairy tales of God in spades. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is David. David, go ahead. Um, first, I wanted to say how much I admire you for turning your passion into a profession. I, I just, I think that's remarkable. And I've read every book von Franz has written about fairy tales, and it's the most transforming work in my life. Oh, so <laughs> um, so I, I just admire that you've turned that into a profession. That being said, I want to give a little pushback on what you said to form my question. I absolutely think that interpreting it from a subjective perspective 
is very valuable, but I understand your points about understanding the objective, but I try and do both. Yeah. And my question is, can you just sort of amplify what you meant by that? Because I think yeah. there is a value to both. I would say the, fa the very fact that you said you try to do both. You know, when I'm working with a client and they bring in a dream or a fairy tale and they are so locked into the subjective, you know, that's their experience. The complex has them. So we have to let it live out to its full in a way that we can look at it. So if you take a fairy tale and you go with that subjective as the first order of analysis, by all means, then go to the objective and see with, with, where you are aligned to the archetypal or maybe where you are misaligned and didn't even know it because therein might be your gold. So uh, yeah, please don't misunderstand what you think and what you feel about dreams and about fairy tales and about just the, the story of your life is essential. And we have to hold that up against things that are enduring truths. Yeah, actually, if I could jump in for a second, because um, I love this question, David, and um, it's a question that's alive for me as well. There, there's one book that I might recommend called The Way of the Image by Yoram Kaufman, because he speaks to this in an interesting way using dream imagery. Have you read this book, Muriel? Yeah much yep so it's sort of like um he gives the example of a dream where um a person encounters an octopus and is very afraid so on the subjective level there's this fear of this um personified image the octopus or personified it's not the right word and, and theo what is it the the animal personification of of something inside of the yeah, dreamer emphasizing Thank you. <laughs> um, what she said. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe I said it. <laughs> there it is. But, but um, so there's an example where the subjective reaction is out of sync with the objective image. So that person's reality as their psyche is presenting it through dreams is saying, hey, you're afraid of this thing that doesn't warrant fear. Versus uh, another example is um, someone who is an addict and that drove their car very fast and they had a dream they were on a rickety raft surrounded by sharks. And in their dream, they weren't afraid at all about a situation that warranted a lot of fear. So in that case, the lack of fear is very out of sync with the circumstances. And it's sort of like a last example that ties it together. If a person is swimming and encounters sharks in their dream and they're appropriately afraid, you could say, ah, yes, their psyche is saying something you're doing particularly probably in the unconscious, is actually dangerous and you're appropriately afraid of it. Yeah. So, so, so it's me always measured against the objective and the subjective. So what you're saying, David, is super live for me as well. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jory, followed by Sue. Jory, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Muriel. I wanted to know what your impressions were of the TV show Once Upon a Time because it has some very dark takes uh, of the fairy tale representation. I know you must be familiar, it ran for seven seasons. I think I watched the first season of it and I got bored very quickly. So I don't know whether that tells you something or not, that um, it felt like um, it was twisting the tales to convey that kind of um, dark edge, which, you know, is fine for a series, but I got bored in a hurry because I didn't feel like it, it, um, it tapped into the, the tales deep enough. So I, I guess I can't comment on someone who sat, sat with it longer than I was able to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, the last question is from Sue, and then we are going to do breakout rooms for 20 minutes so we can discuss these ideas in great amount of detail, after which we're gonna come automatically into this main room and share our takeaways, what we've learned uh, from this. Sue. Um, yes, hi. Um, I guess I have more of a technical question because I noticed that in the discussion of the Frog Prince, you went a lot into the detail of the motherless um, child, et cetera, et cetera. And I have like three, I have four different 
um, editions of the Grimm's fairy tales. And Jack, um, ah, Jack Zipes, I guess, translated the very first edition and it doesn't have all that detail. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mention anything about, you know, the youngest daughter being the most beautiful. It doesn't even mention she's one of three. It, it just, it's very bare bones. And I'm just wondering if we're putting all this emphasis and in inter interpreting this stuff that doesn't appear to be in the first edition, what are we really, um, what are we really <laughs> doing? Yeah. yeah, what you're talking about is the value of cross-referencing. And yeah. cross-reference, then the value in that is to see, well, what was added or what was left out and why? And to then begin to speculate. Why was it added or why was it left out? I remember being in an indigenous lodge one time and the elder started to tell a story. And I turned to someone and said, oh, like we've heard this before. It was a pretty rude thing to say, but I, and I got caught, you know? <laughs> and, and he said, what do you mean you've heard this before? Of course you haven't, because it's a different day. They're different people you know, the weather is different, you know, so the idea that the story has a certain, um, it's, it's, it's got a dichronic nature, and it changes with us. And I think we have to look at that, we have to look at the story from the point of view of what has been added to it, and then what stayed the same. And if we go to what stayed the same, that's where we might be getting at the kernels, that's where we might be getting at the underlying truths. Someone in my course uh, a couple of weeks ago said, you know, you're putting all this emphasis on these tales about like we were amplifying iron, like Iron Henry, what is iron? And we were amplifying frog. And the point that the, the student made was we didn't know anything about that when these tales were told. They didn't know that iron was in blood and carried the oxygen. So aren't we putting these truths? And I said, I'd go the other way. I'd say some of these stories have the truths that we haven't unpacked yet with our sciences. You know, so if you are doing that cross-referencing, cross-referencing in a single tale, but also tales like it from other traditions, then I think it's going to, it's just going to give you, it's, it's going to be a seven course meal as opposed to uh, fast food. Beautiful. Thank you very much, uh, Muriel and uh, Aiden. So folks, now we're going to- I apologize to interrupt, but I just, just before we switch gears, I want to say, uh, Muriel, thank you just so, so, so much. It's really a gift to have you here. And um, it would be a continued gift if you're able to stay, but I also know you're not feeling well. So um, if you need to leave, I just wanted to say that, um, or if you feel that's the right thing to do, um, but your presence is just very much appreciated here. Well, I well, thank you all. I thank you for your engaging questions. And I think I am going to call it a day. <laughs> Take care of my gold. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Muriel. Uh, so folks, uh, we're going to start uh, the breakout rooms. Give me just a second here. Okay. Uh, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Um, after which we come back. During breakout rooms, uh, please give two minutes to everybody who wants to comment about their thoughts uh, and then have a conversation. So that way everybody gets to talk. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about what we are walking away with. Starting the breakout rooms now. All right. Welcome back everybody. All right, welcome back. So folks, now it's time for takeaways. So the question is, what are you walking away with? What did you learn? You can, you're also free to ask a question, but realizing fully well that the most important person you have to be asking questions to is yourself. So put you can put down on the table the most important question that still remains open in your mind if you want. Uh, and then you can share your takeaways. So I'm gonna call on people in the order in which I see them in Zoom. Uh, you are welcome to skip if you don't want to share your takeaway. You can just say uh, skip in the chat. So I'm going to start with Sue, whom I was talking to. So it'll be Sue, uh, Andrew, and Anna. Sue, what's your takeaway from the meetup? Uh, Sue, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. 
Go ahead. We can hear oh, you I'm, now. I'm, I was having technical difficulties. I have an old iPad. Um, my main takeaway is that um, that I like the well that that I noticed that there are these different editions of this fairy tales, and also that I want to take a course from Muriel. That that's my main takeaway. That now I'm kind of motivated to take a course. Excellent. Next up is uh, Andrew. Sure, thanks. Really enjoyed this this uh, presentation. My, my takeaways are one being reminded of this uh, this hero archetype. It's it's very compelling, and it you know raises the question like, is this real? At the same time, I was also reminded that there's a it seems like there's a tendency to believe that there is some kind of fact behind this thing. Uh, you know, let's re to me, I feel like. I need to remember that all this Jungian uh, concepts, they're an interpretation. Uh, and we need to be careful, despite how compelling they are, they're not necessarily truths. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Aiden, so we will have a little bit of time at the end uh, if you would like to comment of, on anything that is being said. So uh, please keep notes of everything and we'll have time uh, to talk about that. Uh, next and actually, quickly, well, uh, Shrikan, if I can jump in, not as a takeaway, but just as an invitation sure. for, the, for those that are still here, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm um, currently growing my coaching practice, and it's not Jungian analysis, although it's informed by Jung, helping people through transitions, self-exploration, and um, I'd be happy to speak with anybody here if they'd like to reach out to me. Um, perhaps they're trying to get on, on track with something um, that is sort of a dream version of their life. So I'm gonna put my email and just know you can reach out to me. Wonderful. Thanks, Rikant. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, next up is Anna, Chris, and Madeline. Anna? Okay, next is Chris, Madeline, and Samantha. Chris. I really appreciate Muriel because I love the multifaceted perspectives that she reminded me of, and that's what creates the beauty of Jung's work and the depths. And I like the internal piece of the object and the subject, and then the universal and the collective object left up to the own subject of the subject that may be looking at themselves. So it was really refreshing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Next up is Madeline, Samantha, and Zach. Madeline? Nope. Okay. Next up is uh, Samantha, Zach, and George. Um, I liked the discussion around the objective analysis as well as the subjective and really reminding myself to do both of those things. Um, and then I like what Miriam said right at the end about um, how she was like, oh, I've heard this story. And then she was like, they're like, but actually you've not heard this story yet because that was a different day and you were a different person and now you have something new in your life and you can take new things away from these stories. So reminding myself to come to, to the story even if I ha do think I've heard of it before with a fresh perspective and uh, childlike curiosity. Wonderful, thank you, Samantha. Uh, next up is Zach, George and Sita. Yeah, we were talking in our breakout room a little bit about the um, either limitations or perceived limitations of having to kind of uh, write a story that exists within a certain archetype um, and how I thought it was interesting how the lecturer talked about how, you know, you can break this as Hercules did, but you kind of do so at your own per peril. Um, and I was in the middle of asking a question and Aiden said to maybe just ask it to the group here when we broke off. And, and my question was, I, I've noticed how um, like there's something about the medieval time period that really seems to capture our imagination and, and it kind of ends up in a lot of these uh, fantasies and fairy tales like Harry Potter and Game of Thrones and such. So I was wondering um, like maybe why that is and if fantasy can exist like I don't know, in like the 1800s or like in, in a different time period or why it is that specific um, period in time that they all seem to revolve around. Thank you, Zach. Uh, next up is George, 
uh, Sita and Linda. George? Yeah, um, my comments were already um, stated. Um, the first one is what Zach said. Um, I like how she emphasized objective truth with regards to archetypal material. Um, and then I also wanted to um, emphasize what Samantha said, um, that we can always approach the story again and again and again, because the implication is that we, we, we're constantly evolving given our experiences. Um, and to say that a story has a terminal, you have a terminal relationship with a story, I think is another way of saying that your development has been arrested. So um, I like the idea, it animates me that a story will always have a promise. Wonderful, thank you, George. Next up is Sita, uh, Linda, and David. Sita? Yeah, I really like the notion of standing in story and exploring what that means and uh, looking at the stories uh, differently every day because your the weather's different, how you feel is different, and therefore where you stand in the story and where you see yourself might also be different and what it might speak to you and say to you. Wonderful, uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Linda, David, and Scott. Uh, I raised this issue in, in our group and, and uh, I'm, really questioning some of this in terms of we're talking about these fairy tales being used as a basis for dream interpretation. Uh, this particular fairy tale, we're talking about a young, beautiful girl uh, rejecting a prince, a, a frog who wants to share her bed and the father turning the frog into a prince and her husband. You know, there's sexual content here. I, we're all adults. I'm surprised that the sexual content has not been ex ex discussed at all. Thank you, Linda. Uh, next up is uh, David, Scott, and uh, Jory. David? Uh, I just want to say again that the structure of this seminar was fantastic. Uh, second time in a row, a really compelling speaker. I don't know why, it just cracks me up how seamlessly we go into these breakout rooms and I'm surrounded by people from all over the world and we're instantly sharing the energy. It's really a magical experience. So I just wanna give a shout out to the organizers that this format's really working for me. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, David. Really appreciate that. Uh, next up, and it's it's uh, Aiden doing part of his magic. Uh, I doing some of the magic and Zoom doing uh, some of the magic, but mostly it is the participants who keep coming. They have a certain kind of approach to learning, uh, kind of openness to learning, uh, combined with willingness to speak their mind, um, be okay with all kinds of disagreements and going back and forth. So I think that's that's what it is. It's a kind of culture of the group that that's what creates the magic primarily. Um, next up is going to be Scott. Scott, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, again, I was here a couple of weeks ago too, and I just want to give a shout out. This is truly incredible. In our group, we had a conversation too, just about how nice it is to connect, whether you're in San Diego or Portland or whatever. So thank you for bringing us all together. I'll also confess that um, although I'm a scientist and have a musician scientist um, who's done a lot of research in perception and cognition, Jungian lens is very new to me. And so last couple of weeks ago, I was kind of um, informed about dreams and, and the interpretation of those dreams. Um, today it's fairy tales. And so I'm learning, I need to take things more seriously, even when, <laughs> even when I think they're just stories or tales or narratives because there's a deeper underlying. So I'm being very naive, I know, but, but that kind of conversation just kind of digs deeper into things that can be very superficial and we've all heard before and yet there are layers that we need to peel the layers of the onion back kind of so I've enjoyed doing that with you and thank you for guiding me I appreciate it thank you Scott uh, next up is Jory Olga and Brian Jory I pass thank you okay next up is Olga Brian and Jenny Jenny Euclid's, yeah. Uh, Olga? Okay, next up is Brian. Okay, next up is uh, Gian, Gianni Piglis. Go ahead. It's, it's Jeannie. Jeannie. <laughs> Hi, you. Jeannie. Sorry. Hi. About Go ahead. I'm very, very new. I just started learning this. So, um, and I was in a group, I think, of 
other people who were newer and um, but seemed to know more than me, but the discussion came up as to what actually constitutes a fairy tale. Is it any piece of fiction? Um, what elements are there? And somebody that I, uh, Zach, that I know from another group had said that there was somebody named Von Franz mm -hmm. that was a patient that, well, anyway, that that would be more enlightening, but um, I didn't know if anybody had any other contributions to that idea. Absolutely. Maybe uh, Aiden will talk about it at the end, end of this. Juan, Juan Franz is a very big figure in uh, Jungian. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin, uh, Donna, and Reina. Kevin? Yes, thank you, thank um, I feel the tale is like a mirror. Every time I read it or remind myself, it's got a different interpretation. Um, actually, for story south today, we talk about I was very interested about the char characters of uh, Frog, Daughter, and King. What's the rules, contract, ethic, uh, uh, virtually follow? It's, it, that, that's I would say make it different. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Next up is Donna, Kevin, Reina, and Laura. Can Kevin repeat the uh, question at the end there? Because I want to perhaps address it, but I didn't understand it. Uh, Kevin, yeah. could you repeat? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question is about the character also in the story. Let's see, what's the frog contract with the daughter? Like, okay, I give you a, a pick a ball, then you, you know, let me, you know, own you or whatever. It's here. How about the frog is cheating? I hold a ball, I have a ball already. The daughter is here saying, I want to commit, but it's not. You can you fr fr frighten me. It's not a, you know, normal contract. I can't break a contract from King. Why King is always is, is good, right? It's okay. a qu question mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Excellent. Uh, next up is Donna, Reina, and Laura. Donna? This was a, a great um, this presentation. I really enjoyed it. And the discussion group was awesome. I want to thank everyone in my discussion group. I learned a lot um, because this topic is really brand new to me. So my group was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Reina, Laura, and Jeff. Reina? Hi there. Um, I just would like to know when you will be revisiting this uh, theme of conversation again. And um, I enjoyed what I missed some of it. So I enjoyed what I caught. Okay, um, so we we do meetups every day. Um, I do about 10 meetups per week. And um, they're all up on the on our YouTube channel. So you can go search for 52 living ideas. So you'll be able to I'll put this recording up as well. So you'll be able to see this there are about, I think 15 to 20 videos on Jungian uh, application of Jung's ideas. Uh, by various people uh, already up there. So that's a good place to start. And we'll be doing this series. Aiden does this series every other Sunday at uh, 2.30. So look forward to seeing you there. Uh, next up is Laura uh, and Jeff. Okay. Um, it, it's been suggested by many people that I write my story. And I would like to use uh, the fairy tale um, to sort of as my template to write it, but how do you do it? I mean, your past is, I guess, object would be objectified and your current would be subjectified, but um, some of it, I think, has to go back and forth between um, being subjectified and objectified, at least I think so. Because um, when you go back to look in the objectified, some of it would become subjectified, but you would see it differently now than you did at that time. So I'm sort of already feeling how complicated that would be. So I'm wondering how could, could it be? Can, can you write your story um, now from this point? You know, is your story have to begin now? Is that where your, you know, begins and that you move from here? Can you actually tell your story from before and now? Wonderful. That's that's a beautiful question. You know, the question about our own stories, and uh, Jordan Peterson has a lot to say about about this, and uh, it's it's a profound question. Next up is going to be Jeff. Jeff. 
Um, so this was a wonderful session. Um, I was struck by Miriam's story regarding how she nearly failed her exam um, because of uh, how she kind of got, got captured by her own uh, reaction uh, to it. And, um, and how, uh, as she said, you know, there's four relationships in any conversation between two people, you're conscious and unconscious of, of, of each of the two people. Um, the, my experience is that in, in any story that I'm telling myself or that I hear others tell um, about themselves or however they might identify the meaning of a fable or a fairy tale, that there's great things to be learned in exploring the exact opposite but possible meaning in order to see what we might learn from the stories we tell each other and ourselves. Uh, thank you, Jeff. All right, um, so folks, uh, we have some time now, uh, Aiden. So uh, I, let, let me make my comments. Um, I was completely blown away by uh, Mariel's presentation here because it's actually, it, it um, for me, it exemplifies what the Jungian approach can be at its best. You start with something like fairy tales, which have been around for so long and which are understandable by a child. And the children actually get it, get the, the core points. And that's a, it's a primary way of communicating deep ideas to children. And to her distinction between objective and subjective was profound of saying that you have to be able to kind of step back and see what patterns of human life out there are captured by these because, and it's important to do that because it is for that reason that fairy tales are as popular as they are, that they actually capture deep patterns of our own existence, our own consciousness in clear, simple, powerful terms, and then relating it to us separately as, as a separate point. So I thought that was, uh, that was just wonderful. And I wish that she, we would have gone through the, we could have gone through the whole story with her. Um, and so that's, that, that was wonderful. So Aiden, that, those are my comments. So now you can uh, talk about anything, any themes that came up or anything that you want on, on this one, uh, on, on fairy tales. Go ahead. Awesome. Thanks, thanks Srikant. I, I loved your, um, your comments there at the end. And um, I'm looking at my notes if I'm not looking at the screen, but um, I just so relate. Yeah, Jungian thought it at its best and her, yeah, her whole story and the way she approaches fairy tales just really, um, does exemplify that. And um, something I want to say, I'll address this in the comments, because I think I'm just going to go through the comments that I can speak to. Um, but what you just said, the, dif the differentiation between objective and subjective patterns and how we apply that to our life, I think what's... <clears throat> Actually, I'll skip ahead because this was going to address somebody's comment, but I, it's worth saying, uh, well, everybody's still here. Jung said the most important question to ask, the most important question to ask is, what myth am I living? What myth am I living? And the reason you can ask such a question, it sounds kind of haughty, like lofty. What myth am I living? What does that mean? The idea is there are archetypal patterns. There are archetypal patterns that multiple people can share in. Um, and even in the Frog King, we see some of these archetypal patterns. Losing the wholeness of self, the golden ball, and having to put chains around your heart to protect against whatever this loss is and um, how, how a person can be out of touch with the positive feminine at the queen level. I mean, it, it, starts to start, it starts to sound a little abstract, but the point is this is a pattern that a person can experience. So when you say, what myth am I living? This kind of addresses what you were saying, Laura. When you say, not just my story, because that's sort of, that's, that's like, um, you know, storytelling in its form of like, um, autobiography or something like that. But when you say, what myth am I living? Say, what archetypal patterns am I living? Where, where am I a victim? Where am I a, um, getting too close to the sun? Where am I, um, you know, um, casting out parts of myself uh, that I can't live in my life? That's my myth. 
And um, the real question is these archetypal patterns, according to Jungian ideas, have a strong gravity. So it's it's not that we're living. It, so in other words, the idea is um, we can get lost in them. If we're not aware of what we're doing, uh, we, we can be living an archetypal pattern. We can be living an archetypal pattern without being consciously aware of that. And that might not be the life that I want to live, for example, right? Like, for example, I have a victim complex, okay? And there's part of my story that relates to sleeping beauty, which is funny to say, but this idea of not being invited is very alive for me. So if I don't know that about myself, I can get very upset when people don't invite me to things. And I can be disconnected from my feminine dimension, which has been put to sleep, the relational side of life. So you see, part of my life is living this archetypal pattern. And if I don't know it, it just continues unconsciously. It just continues unconsciously. If I do see some of the patterns I'm living, I can question them. I can engage with them and say, what am I doing here? And um, then I have a choice about what my life looks like. I don't just get swept away by an archetypal pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like some of my things I have no control over and that's that's that part it's really difficult for me to deal with because mm-hmm. I you know I'm sort of trying to gain control but my brain controls some of it and sometimes it becomes uncontrollable sure and it it really physically becomes uncontrollable for me Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so- and I, I want to, that's such an important question, and it's almost like, um, I wish I had the possibility of addressing it in this group, but um, it is a wonderful question, and it is worth addressing, but I want to go through this, um, these comments as well. It's, um, uh, folks, what we'll do is that let uh, Aiden complete his comments for of, of everybody. Let's not interrupt. Uh, we'll get, you know, what we do is that we do it in a very systematic way, so everybody gets to have their say, and then you know, uh, we get to respond to everybody at once. So that way, all the common issues come out. And then after all the common issues come out, then we can talk about the common issues. Okay, that I think that's the most effective way of getting the most of this opportunity. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Shrikan. I appreciate that. And if something is left unresolved in this group, by the way, just I'll offer one more time, I've left my email. um, And I'm available just to have a conversation just to follow this up. Um, not even on, not just for coaching. I'm also available just to have a conversation to follow this up. So, you know, so, okay. Andrew presenting as fact. Um, I relate to this as well. Is Andrew still here? Um, it doesn't look. Yeah. yeah I'm here. Oh, I'm here. I see. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of your comment, what I would say is it's so true. And the important thing about the truth of what you're saying is, is um, that the fact, act is experienced in the person's life. Like Jung was an empiricist. He was not like a, th- he wasn't that interested in theory. He, he pulled the theory from empirical facts in his practice and in his own exploration of his unconscious. So really the important thing is your experience of it. You know, we can talk about fairy tales all day long, but if you don't have a, re- if you don't have a relational, emotional living experience that relates to it, it really doesn't matter. And the fa- it could be fact, it could not be facted. It becomes arbitrary. So it really becomes how it's lived in your life. That's really the important thing. Um, Sam, with the fresh perspective, yeah, I love that idea too. And it it relates to what what George said and um, a couple of people said, it opens up the possibility of continual learning, right? If George said, if you reach the terminal um, meaning of a dream, you're not gonna get anything else out of it. You've reached, you think you know it. So it's sort of capped. But if you say, well, what if I look at this from a different angle, or if I look at a different image from this story and explore that, you're opening up the possibility of more learning. By the way, that's the exact definition of symbol in Jungian ideas. The differentiation between a sign and a symbol is that a symbol is the best current representation of something unknowable, the best current representation of unknowable. There's always more to know about it. So um, through fairy tales, there's always more to know. There's never a terminal um, point. Zachary, I love this point about the medieval um, imagery. Um, What I can say, it's probably a longer topic, but what I can say about it is kingdoms are often looked at from a Jungian lens as a symbol of the self. 
it captures a, 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 a it captures the meaning of the total personality. So, so often, in terms of 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 a of a kingdom, when you get into a fairy tale, you get in a story. Something is in disarray. Something is out of order, and it affects the whole kingdom. The whole kingdom is asleep. Something has gone missing. There's not a queen. There's not a you know something's happening in the kingdom, and the process of the story is getting the kingdom back in order. So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful corollary for the process of individuation, what we do in, in Jungian um, therapy. Something's out of order. That's why we go into therapy. So that pattern of something's asleep, something's missing, something's got conflict. Um, part of what we're doing is symbolically getting the kingdom back in order, G getting the hierarchy back in order, getting the relationships back in order, and that things are kind of moving and, and alive. And, and somehow it does seem that in the human imagination, medieval times have captured that, that, that image. It, it, that image captures that idea, is my understanding of that. Um, Linda, um, I love your comments. Uh, you know, um, one thing I'll say, I think that's an, this is a longer conversation too, but one thing I'll say, I've heard this quote a couple of times, that Here's the distinction, right? Uh, we talked about this in our group of like sexuality versus power versus creativity versus spirituality, these different instincts. A funny quote that captures this idea is that to Freud, all religion is sex and to Jung, all sex is religious. So that's an important distinction. Jung would say, even a not, you know, this is the, like you said, we're all adults here. So um, this may be, I hope this doesn't push anybody's buttons, but even anonymous sex, y Jung would say, even in like anonymous sex, people that know each other, it's just, a, it's seemingly on the surface physical, on some level is a spiritual desire for connection. So it is, it's an interesting point. It's worth looking at. Yeah. Scott, oh yeah, love, yeah, it's so true, peeling back the onion. It's like what Sam and George said, um, there's always more. And, and again, the symbolic thing is, if you look at a, a story or a dream, there is always more to unravel. Um, uh, Joanne, or I wrote this name down kind of, um, probably uh, incorrectly, Je Jeannie. Jeannie, Jeannie. Jeannie. What is a fairy tale? Okay, the, the distinction between a fairy tale and other stories is that a, a fairy tale is, supposedly um, in the process of collective selection. That's what von Franz calls it, collective selection. So the idea is when a story emerges, perhaps it emerges as a story, as a fantasy, as a dream, as a creative, you know, whatever, uh, imagination writing a story. The idea is in a fairy tale, when that person tells the story to someone else, what's gonna stick is the shared collective stuff, the archetypal nature of the story. There's some cases and examples where stories emerge and stuff is added to it. Stuff is added to the story to further imbue it with the archetypal material as opposed to the material that's only alive for that one individual, for that one person. So fairy tales are actually a, a collective, a process of, of um, collective selection. I like to think of it as almost like archetypal pruning, archetypal pruning. So you, you, hear a, you hear a story and share it, and over time it becomes more and more of the shared qualities about that story. That's why they stick, and that's why we remember them, and that's why they kind of emerge the way that they do. So perhaps as a story emerges that later becomes a fairy tale, it doesn't start off as a fairy tale. It could have to do with that one person's own narrative, their own challenges, their own individual complexes. Like Muriel said, complexes is actually a Jungian term, although we associate it with Freud. But over the process of sharing the story, it becomes more collective. And the stuff that stays alive and gets added is not only about that individual, it's the stuff that we share. That's what makes a fairy tale. Kevin, yeah, I think this, this uh, that your question is a great segue from the last one. The characters and the content and the relationships, it's important to say that it's not, it's not a story necessarily in the sense of it's truly individuals. It's not like there's truly a frog and there's truly a princess and there's truly a king and the contract is, it's what it is, is it's an archetypal drama. So it's an archetypal drama and all of the characters are in relationship to, to express this archetypal drama. Um, so when we get too nitty gritty about one individual thing, it's helpful to use it for amplification, like looking at the frog, looking at the contract, looking at the king, it helps to get nitty gritty and specific. But really, 
the reason it's helpful is because then we see it in the total image of the story, in the total image of the fairy tale, how all of these things are related together. That's the important thing. Not so much that um, the individual nature of each, each character, but how together they tell the drama of the story in the context of the, storm, of the story. That's where the juice is. Um, Raina, yeah, um, I'm just echoing what uh, Shri Khan said. This video will be available on the 52 um, Living Ideas group. So when you, you'll, I'm sure you're aware of that group. When you go on there, there's a link that takes you to all the YouTube videos and you can find this particular one if you want to rewatch. Um, as well as I will um, likely do another episode at some point on fairy tales because it's just an exciting subject that could probably be further explored. So um, keep tuned for that as well. Laura, how to write your story. We kind of touched on this. Um, you know, it makes sense what you're saying about the past being objective and the current being being subjective. But I almost think, um, well, the past is objective in the sense that it's done, it's already happened. Um, it doesn't negate the subjectivity of a life behind us. So um, it's worth, again, the question of what myth am I living, which I think we're starting to uh, um, discuss in this in this conversation. That's all I have. Um, really a pleasure to um, be Wonderful. a part of this conversation with all of you. Yeah, so I want for... to follow up on two things. Uh, one on uh, one, uh, one France approach it. I was quite blown away by the focus on fairy tales. So I want to talk about that briefly, but I want to make the point that uh, George made and Kevin made that these fairy tales capture something very deep and something very persistent in human life. So, Every time you come to come to it, you not only get something new from it, it also acts as a mirror, as Kevin was saying. I found this to be profoundly true because what things it hits you, what aspects of this art hits you depends on where you are. So as you progress, you are going to respond to different parts. So it's like a complex mirror that is showing you yourself, really. And you are trying to see the mirror for partly, and then you're trying to see in being objective that this is what it is trying to capture. And you're seeing yourself in it uh, at the same time. Uh, David, go ahead. Um, I made this comment in my group, but after studying von Franz for a long time, I just look at every narrative and story I see as a type of fairy tale. It could be a, an ad on television, it could be a movie, it could be a dream, it could be a vision, it could be a marketing piece. And so I just like to put out to the group that it's not just esoteric field to study, but now that I see everything as a fairy tale, you start to see what's missing. Like there's no feminine ele element in that ad or that political, and it's really a trippy way to look at everything. So I'm just offering that. It's a very powerful lens to look at every story. And even the most mundane stories, if you start you know, interpreting it, it could make even mundane stories exciting. So it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating topic that really can translate to many different aspects of your life. Absolutely. And one point that uh, Mariel picked up or, you know, kind of talked about very briefly is that actually these stories, old stories, whether it is not just fairy tales, but the religious stories, the myths, all these old stories actually capture a lot more of the human existence, you know, our human experience and nature of human consciousness, human life than science has come to turn with. So we are, you know, science is, so you, it's, it's well worth. Those were the first forms in which human beings tried to, uh, tried to reach out and say, okay, what is human existence like? And stories was one of the first things. We, even before kind of conceptualizing of what is involved in them, which comes much later, you know, people captured it and it is done in all kinds of art. It is done in music, it is done in visual arts. Um, but so, so art forms, it, it is not, 
you know, it, it founds us, it's, a, it, it's this unlimited source from which you can draw out kind of further insights. Um, and I think it, there is no contradiction between being a scientific approach and, you know, doing this. This is, and I think that's why, you know, what Muriel is doing, what Jung did of bringing scientific approach to bear on these stories has tremendous potential. That, that's so true. I want to catch that because um, what you were saying, it almost struck me in this way. It's like stories are the old form of science. Yes. Because they give us a context. They give us a meaning. They give us an understanding. They give us the order that most of us now look for in science to explain the context and the order of our life and, and the world that we live in. So it's so true. I think Jung would say this is really the the, the problem of our day is this. We used to have these stories that were sort of sacred ordering stories that made sense of our reality. And we've moved so far away from that into the scientific rational realm to make sense of the world through science and through cause and effect. And his point is we flipped from one side to the other. And the, the, our, our era is how do we bridge the two? How, how do we do exactly what you just said, Srikant? Maintain the integrity of the story of, of, of the numinous explanation for why we're alive and, and what we're experiencing. How do we maintain that with a scientific lens and together put them? That's, that's really the challenge of today. Wonderful. Let me ask one question to David um, and, and to you, Aiden. Um, I'm, you know, when in my studies, I'm mostly um, focused on going to primary sources. So I've looked mostly at Carl Jung, uh, his own work, but it looks like one France has done something, uh, you know, masterful, which is not actually very common to, you know, in terms of can somebody following up with works? I've not seen something like that. So can uh, David uh, first and then Aiden talk briefly about the contribution of one France to Jungian thought? Well, I mean, uh, my fairy tale is uh, Jung's relationship with von Franz. Um, he was this master who I think he was very challenged sort of communicating practical storytelling. He was very esoteric. And the more I read about him, he was almost purposely esoteric. He sort of prided himself on like, if you're not willing to dig through my esoteric work, you're not ready for the quest. And von Franz was like his youngest disciple and he would you know, take her to his old, you know, stone wooden fortress and literally talked to, and I think her being a woman was fascinating too. And she was very young. And so her mind was very open. And so she's almost the universal translator of his thought in a way that really flows. I mean, he's a great, brilliant writer, but there's something about her where it just flows from her. And so I, when I think of young, I can't think of young without von Franz. She, she translated what he was saying. And so it was an amazing combination. I, I think he really needed her to spread the word. That's how powerful a role that she played in his life. Beautiful, Aiden? Yeah, um, this is kind of dovetailing on um, uh, what what David just said. And yes, Marie-Louis von Franz's name is in the chat. Donna just put it if anybody's curious about the spelling or what her name looks like. But Marie-Louis von Franz, was uh, went into therapy with Jung and then became a therapist. And um, you know, Jung, as I as I remember this, I uh, my, if my memory is correct, Jung described uh, von Franz as the person who best understood his ideas, who best understood them. I think he felt very alone with his ideas because they were so ahead of their time, and um, he was so deep in his own introspection. And so, um, you know. Uh, that relationship was a powerful relationship that she really understood him. Um, he felt the best out of anyone. And um, her, she's written a lot, but the one, the, 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 the material that's really landed for me in terms of very meaningful writings is her lectures on typology. She furthers his points on the personality theories, which you might find interesting, Srikant specifically. Um, um, it, there's, uh, yeah, on typology. Um, she wrote half, and I think James Hollis uh, uh, did the other lecture. That's the other half. 
And she also has a lot of um, fairy tale specific books, um, archetypal patterns in fairy tales. I think there's one called Reading Fairy Tales, Feminine Fairy Tales. And a really interesting one is the redemption motif in fairy tales, the redemption motif, because Muriel mentioned that in the discussion today, what, what redemption can do for a person when they're stuck in a certain pattern or a certain drama and something is redeemed, that's a psychological event that truly is. So um, you see a lot of, and we, we carry that in our modern ideology, our mythos, our Christian heritage, you know, in the West. And um, this, the idea of redemption is massively important in that uh, ideology, uh, especially when it first emerged. So, um, so it, it, but it, it shows up in other stories and dramas as well, this redemption motif. So that's a really fascinating um, book as well. Wonderful, folks. So before we wrap up, I just want to let you know, at five o'clock, we have a very special meetup. Our regular member, Shelly, um, she's gone through a remarkable life transformation over the last few years. Uh, and she's going to be talking about all the ideas that, uh, you know, it, it is really stunning when you hear about it. I would let her talk about it herself. Uh, she, you know, she's, a, she's brought up five boys uh, in a very difficult situation and has done it amazingly, amazingly well. Um, and uh, she's going to talk about all the challenges uh, that she has faced and what, and more importantly, what ideas and what kind of attitudes that have made that possible. All right, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Aiden. And that is going to start at five o'clock. So it's going to be right here. So you're uh, welcome to uh, hang around, take a break and, um, and continue over here, uh, Aiden. This was just amazing. I think this we are off to a great start. I think we are producing something that is that is of lasting value mm -hmm. and it is adding to the conversation. And I think I like this format very much because this is the only way in which people can really master ideas um, of actually hearing the ideas, then talking about it amongst themselves, telling. Uh, it's also very valuable to person who is presenting the ideas because what happens is that most people who think actually live with their ideas for a long time, just like Jung did. Mm -hmm. And it is good to hear how those ideas are being received so that you can you know, modify how to, how to present it. So, so thank you very much. This is, this is uh, wonderful, Aiden. Oh, it's really, it's a pleasure and an honor. I, I appreciate your um, having me be a part of it. And thanks to everyone for coming. We hope to see you at perhaps the event that's following this one at, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it is, Shrikant? That's correct. That's correct. In, 20, in 15, 15 minutes. minutes? In 15 minutes, yeah, in 15 minutes. And, um, and I hope to see you weeks in, in our next Jungian event, which will be Wonderful. posted shortly. So the, yes, so the next uh, Jungian event is going to be two weeks from today.